Hey, it's Dave Brown here, host of Now with Dave Brown on AMI. Check out this latest highlight from the show. COVID-19 has impacted everyone. There's no way elements of your life have not been impacted by this virus and by this pandemic. But it's disproportionately impacted people. People who are marginalized have been disproportionately impacted, and so have people with disabilities. Over and over again throughout the pandemic, we've talked about the ways in which people with disabilities have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. Here to talk more about that is Professor Deborah Steenstra, professor in the Department of Politics at the University of Guelph. Hey, Professor Steenstra, thank you so much for making time to be with us today. We're grateful. Good morning, Dave. Nice to talk with you. So you were recently quoted in the Toronto Star about this matter. In your opinion, how have people with disabilities been invisible during the pandemic and during the government's response? Right. Um, Well, this is based on a report we did um, that was commissioned by the federal government to assess how they've done in terms of COVID um, policies and disability inclusion. And what we found was that people with disabilities were largely invisible and continue to be largely invisible in uh, the pandemic. That's partially because we have very little data about them, partially because the stories that um, we've we've been telling about the impacts on people um, ignore or um, set aside the uh, particular impacts on people. Let me give you an example. So we've heard lots of stories of how seniors who live in long-term care homes have had serious impacts, both in terms of the amount of COVID, uh, the risk to COVID, the isolation policies, but we don't talk about um, that many of those seniors are people with disabilities, nor do we talk about the younger people with disabilities who live who may live in long-term care homes or who may live in other congregate living settings. Um, And and so we also don't talk about how um, some people with disabilities, many people with disabilities have multiple home care workers coming in and how that increases uh, their risk to getting COVID, um, even if they have been vaccinated. We don't talk Um, now about the accessibility of vaccine clinics. So there's lots of impacts that we have. Yeah, there's so many intersectionalities when we talk about it. Disability spans across so many different other areas of focus. And I think you identified a a couple of them right there. One, something we talked about on the show last week was even the inaccessibility for blind people of the the at-home rapid tests. That it's such a visual experience that it's hard for someone with a disability, a visual disability, to actually uh, use those tools. So in general, where were some of the areas where there were shortcomings? How did those shortcomings manifest? Well, we began by having um, the Prime Minister and his crew make announcements to, and I'm saying in air quotes, all Canadians, but failing to have uh, sign language interpretation available early on. Um, And we've seen that consistently, that the communications around uh, the pandemic and around restriction measures haven't always been accessible in a variety of formats. Um, So there's barriers there. We've seen it in the response uh, to the employment, um, the loss of employment opportunities, which have disproportionately negatively impacted people with disabilities, which means more people with disabilities were made unemployed and had fewer employment opportunities during the pandemic. So we've seen less of a response uh, to that situation. Um, We've seen uh, real challenges with income. Um, Some of the measures that the governments have taken um, have have required um, have been modest for people with disabilities, really modest, the $600 uh, uh, the one time payment. The one-time payment, payment, yeah, the one-time benefit, yeah. Was really modest. And for um, many people with disabilities who rely on um, other forms of income than employment income, the CERB program, the Emergency Response Program benefit, uh, either was not available to them or... Their, their provincial social assistance policy clawed back um, the amount that they received. So there was no benefit for mm. it. 
Did your research get a chance to delve a little bit deeper in regard to what the bigger impact was on people with disabilities, whether perhaps that was access to health care, some of the cascading impacts of those financial impacts? Was there an opportunity to dig a little bit deeper and find out what the impact on, on the individuals and a little bit more broadly the community was? Absolutely. Um, this was a 130 page report. We covered 19 thematic areas. So um, it's hard in a few minutes to give. Oh, you yeah, I, I can only imagine. Of, I can only uh, imagine we talked about. But one of the things we wanted to really understand was what were some of the impacts for people with disabilities who, who aren't always um, talked about. So LGBTQ2S um, people with disabilities, Indigenous people with disabilities, racialized people with disabilities. And um, so we talk about uh, how some of those um, inequities, um, uh, um, as you said, cascaded or uh, piled on were cumulative um, for those, those folks who were um, in more marginalized gr groups. And so um, we found, for example, women with disabilities um, who have uh, childcare issues uh, experienced greater impacts even than um, parents without disabilities who have children. And, and that's not often talked about. Um, so there are a number of those cascading um, uh, and cumulative issues, things that pile on and then cascading in terms of, um, uh, you don't want to go out of the house because you're more vulnerable uh, to getting COVID. And that means you live with greater isolation, which means uh, you, um, and you have access to fewer and fewer services, which may mean you feel um, like you have less reason to continue. So um, there's lots, mm. lots going on for people with disabilities. Yeah, the, the mental health side of it is a big one. I, I'm, I'm going to op opine a little bit here from, from my personal sure. experiences as someone who's, who's legally blind. The first two months, three months in 2020 were brutal for everybody. Mm. Everybody had a tough time. But transportation mm -hmm. was one of the things that got to me, not having a car, not being able to drive. That was something that really stood out as people were doing, oh, curbside pickup, this is great. Well, that doesn't help me. But one of the things that I understood is there was there was chaos in those first couple of months, right? That the things are going to be complex and they're going to be different. Everybody was adapting in real time. In your research, did you find any discernible difference in the way disability was considered, that lens was applied, whether it was the federal or whether it was the provincial governments? Because one of the things that's come up here, especially during the Omicron wave, is that when they talk about sort of Omicron being milder, that doesn't mean that it's mild and the people who might be most impacted are people with disabilities who are immunocompromised or might have other underlying conditions. And that was maybe lost a lot in sort of the mainstream conversation. So was there any sense in your research of how time impacted the way the lens of disability was applied? I, I think that, um, yes, I think that initially, uh, as you said, everybody uh, uh, failed to benefit. But I actually think that even with um, disability inclusion lens being taken up, for example, by the federal government, by the British Columbia government, um, and in some cases, we still seemed over the, the years not to get the message that we should be paying attention to people with disabilities first in our analysis, because they often indicate, um, they, we often indicate where um, an inclusive society, what an inclusive society looks like. So, you know, when you um, set up uh, a transportation system that allows um, people to uh, get to the grocery store or uh, to, to see their friends if they're able to, it, it needs to um, make sure that there are, um, uh, we need to stop and think first, what about people as you said, who are immunocompromised or people um, who use other wayfinding tools than sight. Um, and and my, uh, our read as, uh, as the research team found that those still aren't well integrated into the policy development mm -hmm. across the country. And that's, I think, a real shame. And we're seeing that again in the vaccine uh, clinics. We're seeing that, right, like it, it's not very often um, that 
we're thinking ahead. Uh, one example is I, I took my mother uh, to a vaccine clinic and she doesn't have very good mobility. Mm. Um, and uh, there wasn't a wheelchair at the beginning. There was a wheelchair, but it was uh, 600 meters away. Right, right. And so nobody thought about her at the doorstep, right? Mm -hmm. and, and those sorts of pieces aren't yet in people's minds. And that's partially why we talk about the invisibility. It yeah. needs to be front of mind. And to do that, you need to have people with disabilities, with lived experience at the decision-making tables, helping us um, to be clear about what those impacts are and what the solutions are. So we've obviously talked a lot about the negatives here, but in your research, have there been any lessons learned? I think you just mentioned one, right? Representation mm -hmm. in powerful places can help apply that lens. It's Lens doesn't become a word when lived experience is at the decision-making table. But what are some other lessons that have been gleaned from your research? Um, the importance of, of um, income. Um, and I think, you know, the, the current discussions in Canada at the federal level about a Canadian disability benefit are only reaffirmed, the importance of it is only reaffirmed by the experience of COVID, how we need to have um, some recognition both of um, the income and the employment gaps that people with disabilities uh, experience in Canada, but we also need to understand the additional costs that people with disabilities live with day by day. And, and both of those need to be addressed um, to some extent. I think, um, I think we've, we've um, there are some really interesting examples in terms of data from other countries. So for example, in the United Kingdom, um, while Canada did, I think, a, a a relatively poor job of tracking the situation of people with disabilities through uh, reliable, high quality data. The United Kingdom did a much better job. Um, they had good data on gendered, racialized people with disabilities in congregate living settings and non-living um, non -living settings. And I think that's an example that we should follow. Um, another example is in New Zealand, where they um, created a, a response plan that began from the basis of their treaty obligations um, to Indigenous peoples. Um, and this was a disability uh, response plan. And so, uh, you know, they understood that the situation of Indigenous people with disabilities is an integral part of moving forward together. And, and I think that's, again, a good example of what we could be doing better. Yeah, I like that you bring up the data point. You can't make good policy without good data. Otherwise, you're just reacting, 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 and you never get anywhere. Hey, uh, Dr. Steen, uh, Professor Strinstra, we're so, we're so grateful that you were able to give us some perspective on this today. Thank you to you and your colleagues for all the research that you're doing. Thanks so much for having me. Have a good day. Thank you. That's Deborah Steenstra, a professor in the Department of Politics at the University of Guelph. Do you want to dive into more conversations like this? Watch Now with Dave Brown weekdays at 9 a.m. Eastern on AMI-tv or download the podcasts wherever you listen. Do you want to dive into more conversations like this? Watch Now with Dave Brown weekdays at 9 a.m. Eastern on AMI-tv or download the podcasts wherever you listen.